Buddhism is a comprehensive system that shows us how to transform our minds from a state of suffering and dissatisfaction to one of extraordinary joy, awareness, and contentment. Vast in scope and profound in its implications, Buddhism accommodates every kind of mental disposition but retains a laser-like precision that shows us what is to be accepted and what is to be rejected. It was realized and embodied by a human being like us. 2,500 years ago, an Indian prince named Siddhartha from the Shakya clan decided to give up his kingdom to search for a way out of suffering. Because of his relentless determination to find ultimate freedom, he came to understand the nature of his mind and in turn the ultimate reality of all phenomena. He was then called Shakyamuni Buddha. In this show we will learn about the historical Buddha's life story, the spread of his teachings, and about the stages of the path to enlightenment. In the following presentations, you're about to hear a great deal about the life, the accomplishments, and the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha. Now, the Buddha worked very hard in order to attain enlightenment, and the impetus behind that hard work was his strong motivation to achieve ultimate freedom and to benefit all living beings as much as possible. And so remembering that we've discussed in the past the importance of our own motivation and modeling after the historical Buddha himself, now, before receiving these teachings, set in your own mind a strong motivation to be able to traverse this spiritual path, to reach enlightenment as quickly as possible in order to benefit all living beings. format that the life of Buddha is often presented in in the Mahayana tradition is the presentation of what are called the Twelve Deeds. The Twelve Deeds are said to be the same activities that all of the thousand Buddhas who will appear during this fortunate eon in this world system, they'll all engage in these same kinds of activities. They won't have exactly the same lives, They'll be born in different ways, but they'll have certain format of their life that will be uh, similar. And so for that reason, sort of, you might think it's, it's just something that happened in the past, but it's going to happen in the future. So if you know about it, maybe you can be prepared when Maitreya comes and others. In the Mahayana scriptures, it's said that the, the Buddha himself, the first deed is his leaving of Tushita, handing over the... Uh, the teachership of Tushita, the, the residency there, to Maitreya, who will be the next Buddha. And the second deed is entering into the womb. The Buddha entered into the womb of his future mother, and at that point she had this dream, very spec spectacular and pleasant dream, of a six-tusked white elephant entering into her. And uh, upon and exiting the womb upon his birth, the Buddha was able to stand up. This young boy was able to stand up immediately and walk seven steps. The Buddha himself showed, Siddhartha himself, showed himself to be incredibly you know, adroit and expert in many different things. And the next deed is called sporting or enjoying with the harem or, or retinue of wives. Every kind of pleasure every kind of sense pleasure, food and warmth and uh, various 
castles were built within the, the walls of the, of the temple, of the uh, city, of the royal city for Gautama. And it's at, during this point that he is now manifests kind of like what, what, we might mani what we might notice in the world when people are, get a little bit bored. He, he wants to go out of the temple as his first journey out. He did see uh, some individuals and on successive journeys he saw at various times uh, old people, sick people, and a dead person. And through an, an each time he would ask his attendant, um, what, what is this? I've never seen this before. What, what is this old person bent over and so forth where, with a K? What, what's wrong with him? And, and his uh, attendant would say, this is, um, this is an old person. This, this happened, and, and Siddhartha would say, well, is that unusual? Are there many of them? And he, and he would say, this happens to everyone. Everyone, you know, this is the fate of everyone. And, he saw someone who looked like a renunciate, someone who is uh, seeking the meaning of life, to tr seeking to transcend birth, death, and uh, aging, you know, aging, death, sickness, and so forth, the things that the Buddha had perceived. So this gave, the supposedly was the element now that began to coalesce, that clicked in the, the Siddhartha's mind. This is what I should do. I should leave home also. And he takes the act, he, he takes his hair, his beautiful royal locks, and with his sword cuts them off. And it's said that that's one of the relics. He goes off seeking teachers, seeking the answer to sickness and old age and death. And even though uh, the teachers themselves were very fond of Siddhartha, recognized him as a prince and saw his great qualities and the fact that he achieved their state, even though they were the teacher, he'd achieved the same realization they did in a very short amount of time. They asked him to stay on and teach their disciples. He refused and went off to try to find an answer to this riddle that he had encountered. Sometimes living on just a, you know, a, a small berry from the tree a day, the Buddha became, Siddhartha became very emaciated. So, at this point, the Buddha himself is beginning to recognize that he's not making any progress. Um, the Buddha went to bathe in the river, found himself very weak, couldn't even get out of the water. Uh, began to worry, you know, how, what's going to happen. He began then to beg some food. Now the Buddha is invigorated, Siddhartha is invigorated, and he, he seeks now a place to do meditation, then sits down on this cushion of grass with the determination until I achieve the essence of, of enlightenment, I am not rising. So this is now the demarcation of the, the next act, which is called the defeat of Mara, or the defeat of the Maras. Mara is someone who, some, it can be part of our own being, our own mind, or it can be something external that hinders our spiritual development. And that evening, he achieves his enlightenment, which is now called the next deed, under the Bodhi tree that evening, uh, completely transformed, eliminating from his mind all the vestiges of, of ignorance and uh, any kind of in, insufficiency, inabilities, and uh, spends the next seven weeks without moving very far away. So who shall I teach? Oh. Those five disciples with whom I spent six years, their minds are only, their dharma eye is only slightly covered with the dust of ignorance. So he travels, uh, knowing where they are, to the Deer Park in, uh, in, um, near Sarnath. And he begins to teach them on the very first discourse on the Four Noble Truths. And this is the beginning of this deed, which was essentially the, the next long period of the Buddha's life. So many decades teaching. And uh, for the rest of his life at, at that time, after that time, 
uh, spent many decades teaching, turning the wheel of Dharma, finally took the aspect of passing away, uh, dying, passing into Pura Nirvana. So that, in a nutshell, just as a, sort of an introduction, is a little bit about the life of the Buddha, the 12 deeds. Something you hear again and again, Lam Rim, graduated path. Uh, so, uh, no, Lam, Lam means path, and uh, Rim means graduated or graded, yeah, step by step. And uh, this uh, 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 way of uh, practicing is very specific, you know, to um, the Tibetan Buddhist presentation. Uh, of the path. Um, you know, if we think a little bit about the history of Buddhism, because the Lam Rim contains all the <coughs> Buddha's teachings on Sutra. You know, the Sutra path. There's two paths, the Sutra and the Tantra. Mm -hmm. And the Buddha's path on Sutra is divided up, you know, in the Hinayana attitude and the Mahayana attitude. And uh, the Hinayana and Mahayana path, they are all included in the Lam Rim. You know, the main difference between Hinayana and Mahayana is mainly in the attitude, the purpose and the goal. Yeah? That uh, in the Hinayana, one motivates oneself for one's own liberation. In the Mahayana attitude, the attitude is seeking um, enlightenment uh, you know, for the sake of all living beings, a more universal goal. And for that we train ourselves in renunciation, bodhicitta, and the correct view. Of course, actually to attain enlightenment one also has to practice Tantra. They say that uh, one cannot attain complete full enlightenment without at some point practice highest yoga Tantra. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if you look aside from the attitude, the actual practices of Hinayana and Mahayana go together. They're not sort of two completely separate paths. So the Lam Rim contains all of the teachings. The Hinayana spread to um, different countries like Sri Lanka, Thailand, you know, and uh, Burma, Vietnam, there, and flourished there. Later on, when the, when the Mahayana flourished, that spread to China, Tibet, uh, Mongolia, and uh, the northern countries, and flourished there. So anyway, the great Atisha, he came to Tibet, so he wrote the first Lam Rim, you know, the graduated path, taking all of Buddha's teachings, but putting them in a very clear step-by-step step you know, approach. And he called it the three scopes. So in Tibet, this really flourished. So this is what we still practice today. You know, when you see these Lam Rim texts and Lam Rim books, uh, it's all the same way of uh, approaching the spiritual path and the inner development.
So Lama Atisha, what he did was he presented all of the, the, the essential points of Buddha's teachings in this experiential way. And he, he, presented, them, he presented them essentially in three stages. The first, second and third scopes, they're called. Scope has a very specific meaning. It, it, it relates to the capacity of the practitioner, the scope or the capability, as Lama Zopa says. So the first scope, the first and second scopes of the practice, of the teachings, they represent all the teachings, all the essential points in, a, in Buddha's, Buddha's teachings that we know as the Hinayana part of the path, Hinayana path. Then the third scope is the, is the Mahayana part of the path. The three scopes altogether represent, is, is all the practices that a person who's on the Mahayana path would practice, because you need to do the first two scopes in order to accomplish the third. You guys, if you're a Mahayana practitioner, you don't just do the third scope, which is all the compassion. The wisdom wing is the first two scopes, the Hinayana part of the path, and the, and the, and the, and the compassion wing is the Mahayana path. Altogether, a Mahayana practitioner would practice all of these, because you need the first two, the, the, the wisdom wing, in order to accomplish the compassion wing. You need both wings. A bird needs two wings. So it's the way to, working on the wisdom wing is, 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 is where you really work on yourself. You turn yourself into this amazing being. Then qualified to actually do the job, you know, of benefiting others. And what we really are is a potential Buddha. You know, if it is true that this is our true nature, this is who we really are, then we indeed need someone to show us how to do it. So we look to the need for a teacher. And then there are various ways that are ex explained in the texts of how to devote oneself appropriately, the very heart of which is the idea of, of training our minds to see the Lama, the teacher, the spiritual guide, as the Buddha. That the most benefit comes to oneself from this practice. And then our teacher gets, this is, this is, this is, this is, that point of guru devotion is put there by the 14th century Lama of this tradition called Tsongkhapa. And the third point on the preciousness of this life that we have right now, not just to take it for granted. And this gives us enormous energy to want to not waste it. Then the first point we discussed in the first scope was the, was the need to think about impermanence, but specifically the impermanence of this very person, which energizes us to even more want to not waste this life. But death is definite, its time is uncertain, and that the only thing that can benefit us at the time of death is the virtuous imprints in our mind, nothing else. Then, we need to, then this leads us on to the next contemplation, the first scope, as we discussed, which is looking at the, at the, logical, um, the, logical, the logical likelihood of suffering lives in the future, given that we have a continuity of consciousness that is literally beginningless, given, given that we've, we've um, been within, within samsara, having ignorance and therefore delusions and therefore being reborn again and again and again, and therefore creating negative karmas endlessly, as well as positive ones. So it's logical, it's just logical that there are a lot of, that there's a, possi a possibility of many suffering rebirths that, we, that our mind could take when it leaves this body at the time of death. So Atisha gets us to contemplate the suffering of the lower realms in order to energize us to have a healthy revulsion of being born in this way. This then leads us naturally to the next point to turn for refuge to Buddha, who's the person who existed two and a half thousand years ago, who gave us the path which is the actual refuge, the Dharma itself, the methods, the methods, the medicine to cure our minds, the methods to help ourselves transform ourselves to avoid suffering in the future. <coughs> and this lead, leads us then to the, to the culmination of the first scope, which is the essence of the practice, which is abiding by the laws of karma. Learning to know what to do and learning to know what to avoid, avoid doing, simply to avoid suffering and to get what we do want, which is happiness. It's a very practical solution because one of the things that we're seeing clearly from understanding karma is that we are responsible for our own suffering and we're responsible for our own happiness, literally. In the second scope, we look more deeply. We look more in a more sophisticated way into our minds and start to see how even this life is in the nature of suffering. But it's much more subtle awareness we need to develop. It really is where we learn to be our own therapists. Understand very deeply in the context, for example, one way of looking at this whole scope is in the context that we discussed last week of the Four Noble Truths. That in the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the essential point of that is the third one, which is Buddha's assertion that we can be free of suffering. This then really prepares us now to practice the second wing, the third scope, which is the work we do in relation to others. The heart of which is the development of compassion, specifically the development of the very focused, highly developed level of great compassion called bodhicitta. There's love and compassion, for example, these two essential characteristics. Love is the wish 
that others be happy. Compassion is the wish they don't suffer. It takes two different aspects of a person's life. So, you know, if you love a person, you would see the person and you would be delighting in their good qualities. If you, if, if, if you have compassion for a person, you look at the person and you, have, and you have sorrow at their suffering. You know, you wish they didn't suffer. You have empathy with them, their suffering. Right now, we have the wrong way of cherishing others. We do it because they're our friends and we want them to love us because we can keep being happy. It's completely got strings attached right now, the way we cherish others. And this is why, too, when we have our compassion now, we do have compassion now. We have compassion that's based on attachment. And so it always drags us down. That's why even if we're in the, in the helping professions, we're being very compassionate. We get exhausted and drained. You know, It drags us down. If we have to help people, mentally or physically, we get dragged down by it we, because we still have attachment to our own needs. So we're talking here of being way beyond attachment, really extraordinary, to go to extraordinary degrees of genuinely cherishing others with no strings, which is almost inconceivable in our culture. Because in our culture, ego is the reference point. It's the realisation of the wisdom of emptiness that uproots finally the instincts of ego, which completes the wisdom wing. And then the work of benefiting others is what culminates, is what, is, uh, is what complete, is completes the active, proactive work of benefiting others, compassion. So it's the, then, then that person who finally becomes a Buddha, it's they've perfected the two wings, completed the two wings, completed the wisdom, completed the compassion. You know? Presenting the path, you know, the Lam Rim and the way that uh, Atisha, Lama Atisha and Lama Tsongkhapa put it together, it's like the blueprint. It's sort of taking all the Buddha's words and putting it into the order that we need to actually apply it in our lives. And so if I'm feeling like I, I'm a little bit lost, I don't really know where I need to put my energy and my attention and my practice, it's really easy. The teachings say, and I think this is really true, you can't develop the more advanced realizations if you don't have the very basic ones. I mean, if you haven't coped with our own impermanence and death and suffering, it's impossible to really have a true motivation to get out or even to help others because we haven't really allowed ourselves to get in touch with how bad it really is to give us the energy to develop the qualities to make it as good as it's possible to be. Yeah, I think the first 12 or 13 years of my practice, I didn't do it that way. I kind of was a lot more hit and miss and really into, you know, trying these more advanced practices and thought they were really cool. And, but I, I, I don't think I fundamentally was becoming a better human being. And I, it's not until I really went back and thought, you know, I'm not getting anywhere as fast as I wanted to go. So maybe I, I should do it the way they explain it, you know, that you're really supposed to do it and spend a year on precious human rebirth and spend a year on death and impermanence until something really moves in my mind. So that's been my experiment the last three to five years and from at least from my personal experience, my internal experience, I think it's really, I'm finally feeling some shifts take place. And the thing that I find really interesting is that as, as I focus really on the beginning steps even though I'm focusing most of my attention on the beginning, the other areas actually come more into focus. It's almost like dominoes, a domino effect. Yeah, then it's just a question of not being lazy and stop wasting time and just do the steps. And then maybe become a Buddha, help some people or something. It'd be great. I'd like to do that.